All right, chemistry, this is part one of your video lecture for chapter three. And in this part one, we're going to cover both sections one and two in your textbook, chapter three. So we're going to start by talking about the atom and what it came from. Not the atom itself, but the idea of an atom. So what I want you to be able to do at the end of <clears throat> section one is be able to explain the law of conservation of mass the law of definite proportions, and the law of multiple proportions. Then summarize the five essential points of Dalton's atomic theory, then explain the relationship between Dalton's atomic theory and the laws of conservation of mass, the law of definite proportions, and the law of multiple proportions. Let's get started. So the idea of an atomic theory is more than 2,000 years old. And when I say atomic theory, I mean, what is an atom? Because until recently, scientists had never seen evidence of atoms. And I do mean very, very recently. The law of definite proportions, the law of conservation of mass, and the law of multiple proportions support the current atomic theory. The figure to the right is a more accurate representation of an atom than the figure on the left. So this a whole idea of an atomic theory. It's a theory of what an atom is. Now, there was the original idea of what an atom uh, is, and that idea was shown to be inaccurate, uh, especially once experimentation, um, particularly quantitative um, experimentation, became the norm. <coughs> Several inaccuracies were established um, in the, at that time, the current atomic theory. And so because of that influx of data, that influx of information, the idea of what an atom is had to change. And so we say atomic theory to make sure that we denote the fact that we're not done with the idea of what an atom is. We haven't come to the final answer. We are just part way down the road that will lead us to the idea, the understanding of what the atom truly is. And so that's why we use the term, the term theory, okay? Because uh, there are things that are correct about the current idea, but there are probably still many things that are incorrect about the current idea. And when that information is found, we'll have to change the current understanding, which has hap happened several times uh, between now and, uh, you know, 2,000 years ago. Oh, too far. The law of definite proportions, which is one of the things you're going to be, have to be very familiar with, states that a chemical compound always contains the same elements in exactly the same proportions by weight or mass. Definite proportions. This law is also known as the law of constant composition, right? Always being made of the same things. Definite proportions, defined, it is defined that way, as opposed to infinite, it's definite, right? defined proportions. So the chemical compound is always arranged in the exact same proportions by weight or mass. <clears throat> the law of definite proportions also states that every molecule in a substance is made of the same number and types of atoms. So the example that we're going to use uh, throughout, uh, throughout this section, or uh, especially when talking about this idea, is that uh, table salt, sodium chloride, is always made up of one atom of chlorine and one atom of sodium. That's what we call it, sodium chloride. But anytime you're dealing with sodium chloride, table salt, it's always one atom of sodium and one atom of chlorine. And if you're dealing with something that has anything but one atom of chlorine and one atom of sodium in, in anything additionally, it's not table salt. It's not that sodium chloride. It's something else because sodium chloride is defined by this proportion, one sodium, one chlorine. Table salt, sodium chloride, always consists of 39.34% by mass sodium and 60.66% by mass chlorine, no matter how big the sample is or where it comes from. The salt in the walls of a salt mine might consist of 786.8 tons of sodium and 1,213.2 tons of chlorine, but the proportion is still 39.34% by mass sodium and 60.66% by mass chlorine. A salt shaker with 100 grams of salt would contain 39.34 grams of sodium and 60.66 grams of chlorine. The proportions are still the same, 39.34%. 
A single grain of salt still contains 39.34% bimass sodium and 60.66% bimass chlorine. Thank you, Robot Lady. So next, the law of conservation of mass. All right, one of the three things that we have to be aware of for this section, the three laws. The law of conservation of mass uh, states that mass cannot be created or destroyed in ordinary chemical and physical changes. Now, that the last part of that statement is very important because uh, mass can be uh, destroyed or created. It's a, a conversion between mass and energy. However, that's not an ordinary chemical or physical change. That's, that's a very high level, very, ener this very energy dependent equals mc squared type stuff. <clears throat> so when we say that mass cannot be created or destroyed, we're talking about ordinary chemical or physical changes. So for our purposes, since we're only going to deal with ordinary chemical and ordinary physical changes, for us in this context, ma uh, mass cannot be created or destroyed. The <clears throat> which means functionally, and what we're going to rely on moving forward on several different uh, subjects, is that the mass of the reactants is always going to be equal to the mass of the products. So let's take a look at a representation of that. So we have a reaction between hydrogen gas and oxygen gas to create water. So we have the two reactants because they are reacting together. And then we have the product, the water. We notice that if we take the mass of each of the reactants, add them together, we get the mass of the products. Mass of the reactants added together equals the mass of the products. And if you use your newly acquired skills in um, adding numbers in scientific notation, you can double check this work and you can see that it is in fact true. This law of conservation of mass states that the total amount of matter in a closed system remains constant. In other words, matter cannot be created or destroyed during ordinary chemical reactions. In chemical reactions such as the combustion of this match inside a closed container, we find that the mass of the starting materials is the same as the mass of the ending materials. The law of conservation of mass explains why we represent chemical reactions as balanced chemical equations. The number of each atom on each side of the equation is conserved, representing that mass is conserved. The law of conservation of mass works for most things you encounter in daily life. In 1905, however, Albert Einstein showed that matter and energy could be equated with his famous E equals mc squared equation. The implication of this is that the law of conservation of mass will not hold for cases where large amounts of matter were converted to energy, such as in nuclear reactions. The law was revised to become the law of conservation of total mass and energy. Thank you, robot lady. So on to our third law that we'll have to remember. So we have the law of definite proportions. We have the law of conservation of mass. And we have the law of multiple proportions. The law of multiple proportions states that when two elements combine to form two or more compounds, right, two or more compounds, the mass of one element that combines with the given mass of the other is in the ratio of small whole numbers. And so we can see the example here, nitrogen monoxide, nitrogen dioxide. I hope that you can tell that just from the name, there's nitrogen and oxygen in both of them. There's one nitrogen, one oxygen for monoxide, one nitrogen, two oxygens for dioxide, but it's always nitrogen and oxygen, which goes back to our definition when two elements, nitrogen and oxygen, combine to form two or more compounds, nitrogen monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, the mass of one element that combines with a given mass of the other is in a small whole number ratio. And so when we combine nitrogen with oxygen, they'll always occur at whole number ratio. So in this example, the mass of the nitrogen and both of these is the same. It's 14.01 because that's the molar mass of one uh, of a nitrogen, molar mass of nitrogen in general. But if we have NO, only one mole of oxygen, right? That's 16, 16 grams. But in NO2, there are two moles of oxygen, so that we have to so we have to double the mass due to oxygen. It goes from 16 to 32. 
So with these two uh, sets of numbers, we can find the ratio of oxygen to nitrogen. And so we'd have 16 grams divided by 14 grams, right? 16 grams of oxygen divided by 14.01 grams of nitrogen. Divide that out, and it end up being 1.14 grams of oxygen for every one gram of nitrogen for nitrogen monoxide. We do the same thing with nitrogen dioxide. We'd have the 32.00 grams of oxygen divided by 14.01 grams of nitrogen for a ratio of 2.21 grams of oxygen for every one gram of nitrogen. So here's the multiple proportions thing. Notice how 2.21 is double 1.14, right? And anytime you add more oxygen, like for NO3 or maybe an NO4, you'll see that there's going to be a doubling and a tripling and a quadrupling, right? They're going to be small whole number ratios. The law of multiple proportions states that the mass ratio for one of the elements in a compound that combines with the fixed mass of another element can be expressed in small whole numbers. This law can be demonstrated using two compounds formed from hydrogen and oxygen, water and hydrogen peroxide. A 9 gram sample of water results from the reaction of 1 gram of hydrogen gas with 8 grams of oxygen gas. A 17 gram sample of hydrogen peroxide results from the reaction of 1 gram of hydrogen gas with 16 grams of oxygen gas. We note that the amount of hydrogen in both samples is the same. The ratio of the masses of oxygen in these two compounds is 8 to 16 or 1 to 2. From this, we can deduce that there must be twice as much oxygen in hydrogen peroxide as there is in water, and the same relative amount of hydrogen in both. It does not tell us, however, exactly how many atoms of each element make up the molecule. We now know, for example, that both water and hydrogen contain two atoms of hydrogen per molecule a fact we could not deduce from the law of multiple proportions, which simply told us that we had the same relative amount of hydrogen. Now moving on to our first atomic theory. Now when I say first atomic theory, the idea of the atom actually originated from um, a Greek philosopher uh, named Democritus. Um, he had this idea of the atom, among other things. He, he did other things as well. Um, but he did this, this mind experiment, because that's what the, the Greeks would do. they do mind experiments, and they would ask themselves questions. And uh, using the Socratic method, they would answer yes or no, and then they'd continue with that line of reasoning until they reached some sort of useful conclusion. Well, Democritus asked himself, if I was going to cut something in half, and in his own example, he used cheese. Um, and he thought to himself, if I had this block of cheese, and assuming I had an infinitely sharp knife, right? So the, the ability of the knife to cut is not, not uh, in question here. If I cut the, block of and cut the block of cheese in half, I'll have a smaller piece of cheese. And then if I cut that piece of cheese in half, it'll get smaller still. Now, if I continue to cut and cut and cut and cut and cut and cut, always cutting in half, will there ever be a point at which I, I reach a piece of cheese that is so small that I fundamentally cannot cut it in half anymore? Now, remember, he assumed that he had an infinitely sharp knife, right? That's part of his mind experiment. And so the thought was more related to the nature of the cheese or the smallest unit of cheese that exists. Um, and he concluded that, no, there's going to be a point at which I can no longer cut the cheese because, no pun intended, because the, the unit of cheese has a fundamental smallest portion, a fundamental smallest quantum. And he called that an atomos, which is Greek for uncuttable, non-divisible. And so uh, because of the lack of uh, quantitative analysis back in the day, the idea was left um, pretty much untouched for uh, almost 2,000 years. And then in the early 1800s, John Dalton kind of took up that word atomos, the you know undividable, indivisible. And uh, this was about the time of the, the, the widespread acceptance of quantitative analysis. And John Dalton developed his own atomic theory. Now, uh, you're responsible for learning this, and it's important to the history of chemistry, not because, uh, uh, because it is so correct, because there are actually several, several weak points in it, but because uh, it is the first fully-fledged atomic theory. So it's more of a history lesson here. Uh, for, ex for example, Dalton believed that only a few kind of atoms made up all matter. And so not 
unlike your earth, fire, wind, and water um, a concept of elements from the early Greeks and the Romans, which actually is uh, where the term quintessential comes from. Uh, you're trying to find the fifth element that's going to make everything make sense. Quintessential, fifth element. According to Dalton, elements were com uh, composed of only one kind of atom, right? So hydrogen, the element hydrogen was made up of hydrogen atoms. The element oxygen was made up of oxygen atoms, right? So elements um, are composed of only one kind of atom, and compounds are made when you take two or more kinds of atoms and react them together. They stick together. Now, Dalton's atomic theory uh, contained five postulates, and you're going to be responsible for each of these. So here they are. All matter is composed of extremely small particles called atoms, which cannot be subdivided, created, or destroyed. It's the first postulate. Remember that. Second postulate. Atoms of a given element are identical in their physical and chemical properties. Second postulate, remember that. Third postulate, atoms of different elements differ in their physical and chemical properties. Okay, so that's kind of like the, the, uh, the other side of the coin from postulate two. On number four, atoms of different elements combine in simple whole number ratios to form compounds. And in chemical reactions, atoms are combined, separated, or rearranged, but never created destroyed or changed. Now data gathered since Dalton's time shows that the first two principles are not true in all cases but remember we're not remembering this uh, atomic theory because of its you know quote-unquote correctness but because of the fact that it was the very first atomic uh, theory that was generated. Now students get this a little bit uh, uh, confused so let me just reiterate here those three laws that we uh, established earlier in the, the video, the law of definite proportions, the law of conservation of mass, and the law of definite, or sorry, multiple proportions, is the quantitative analysis that John Dalton based his atomic theory on. He was actually very involved in establishing um, the law of definite proportions and the law of multiple proportions. And so using his experience with quantitative, quantitative analysis, he put that together to generate the list of principles that you see here. So that covers pretty much all of section one. We're going to move on to section two here, but it's all within the first part um, of your video lecture. So uh, starting with section two, talking about the structure of the atom, you're going to have to summarize the observed properties of cathode rays that led to the discovery of the electron, summarize the experiment carried out by Rutherford and his co-workers that led to the discovery of the nucleus, and list the properties of protons, neutrons, and electrons, and then lastly, define atom. So here we go. Let's talk about subatomic particles. Experiments by several scientists in the mid-1800s led to the first change to Dalton's atomic theory. Again, this is a theory. It changes over time. When more information is gained, it is very, very common. You know, almost all the time, we have to go back and change a currently existing theory so we can make it more and more accurate. Not that it's ever going to be 100% true, but we're definitely going to strive to go that way, to be in that direction, to get more and more accurate. Scientists discovered that atoms can be broken into pieces after all. Remember, that was one of John Dalton's postulates, that you can't, they can't be subdivided um, or broken into pieces, but in fact, scientists showed just a few years later that they could. The smaller parts that make up atoms are called subatomic particles. Sub as in underneath, right? Lower, beneath the atomic level, right? Subatomic particles. The three subatomic particles are the most important in chemistry, or sorry, um, sorry, the subatomic particles that are most important in chemistry are the electron, the proton, and the neutron. Since this time, even more have been discovered, things like the quark and the boson, things like that. We don't deal with those in chemistry. That's more of a physics thing or quantum physics thing. For chemistry, we stick with electrons, protons, and neutrons. And you'll hear a lot about them as we go. So let's talk about how the electron was discovered. In fact, it was the first subatomic particle. Uh, during this time, it was very, very popular to do experimentations with electricity because information about electricity was becoming uh, in demand because electricity itself, uh, the ability to get into some sort of uh, electric grid was becoming uh, more and more common, and so electricity needed to be understood. And so while studying current, a scientist named J.J. Thompson, that's a British spelling, that is how it's spelled, Thompson, pumped most of the air out of a glass tube. Uh, as part of his experiment. He applied a voltage to two metal plates called electrodes, which were placed at either end of the tube. Now, he was going to try to see if 
current was able to jump from one uh, metal plate to the other metal plate in a vacuum, right, in the absence of, um, of gas. One electrode called the anode was attached to the positive term terminal of the voltage source, and so it had a positive charge. The other electrode, called a cathode, had a negative charge because it was attached to the negative terminal of the voltage source. Fair enough. Anode, negative. Sorry. Um, because it's attached to the, 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 positive, uh, the positive side, the positive um, terminal, that's where the electric, sorry, the, the negative charge flows. The other electrode, the cathode, is attached to the uh, negative terminal. So in, since it's the negative terminal, that's where the positive charge will flow. So <clears throat> when he set this up, Thompson observed that a glowing beam came out of the cathode and struck the anode, right? Came from one side, right, from one plate to the other plate. It jumped from one plate to the other out of the cathode, from the cathode to the anode. Um, and it caused, uh, and the nearby glass walls of the, of the tube. He called these cathode rays. Why? Because they came out of the cathode. The glass tube that uh, Thompson used is now called a cathode ray tube because it was a ray that came out of the cathode and it was in a tube. Uh, you've seen these things, they're called CRTs, uh, not very much anymore, but they were very commonly used in older television sets, computer monitors, and radar displays, even though they're pretty much extinct in terms of an actual um, electronic device. Because the cathode ray came from the negatively charged cathode, Thompson reasoned that the ray was negatively charged. Makes sense, right? If it comes out to the thing a charge, uh, attached to the negative end, it's probably a negative itself. Thompson confirmed this prediction by seeing how electric and magnetic fields affected the cathode ray. Thompson also observed that when a small paddle wheel was placed in the path of the rays, like, you know, just put it in the way, the wheel would turn as though something was hitting it and causing it to turn. This suggested that the cathode rays consisted of tiny particles because they must have mass if they're going to collide with a, uh, with a paddle wheel and make it turn. Because if it was pure energy, the, the paddle wheel wouldn't turn. And so since something was hitting it that had mass, it must be made of particles. Thompson's experiment showed that a cathode ray consists of particles that have mass and a negative charge. These particles were later called electrons. An electron is a subatomic particle that has a negative electric charge. Electrons are negatively charged, but the atom itself overall has no charge. It's neutral. And so atoms must contain some positive charge to balance out the negative charge of the electron. And so further experimentation was required. But down here we have um, we have the electron symbols that represent the electron. Uh, you might see it represented this way in books. This is the absolute charge of an electron. This is the relative charge of an electron and then the mass of an electron. When the cathode and anode of a cathode ray tube are connected to a voltage source, electric current flows through the tube and can be seen as a cathode ray. The cathode ray is made up of electrons. When a positive electric field is placed next to the tube, the path of the electrons moves toward the field. Using the strength of the electric field and the amount of deflection, J.J. Thompson was able to calculate the ratio of the charge of electrons to the mass of electrons. Imagine a baseball player throwing a ball. Like the cathode ray, with no outside influences, the ball goes straight when the baseball player throws it. A strong wind, however, could blow the ball and make it go off course. An outside positive field attracts the electrons in the cathode tube and makes them go off course. If the baseball player threw a lightweight plastic ball instead of a regular baseball, the wind's effect would be even more evident. The mass of the ball is one of the factors that determines the path the ball will take. Similarly, if the wind were stronger and the baseball player used the original ball, the wind's effect would be more evident. The strength of the outside force is one of the factors that determines the path the ball will take. By observing the path of electrons in the cathode tube, Thompson was able to calculate the ratio of charge to mass of an electron. Thank you, robot lady. Thompson proposed that the electrons of an atom were embedded in a pos positively charged ball of matter. 
Remember, they knew that there had to be some source of positive charge to balance out the negative electrons because the atom overall had a no charge, neutral. It was neutral. And so he just kind of came up with this idea, didn't know if it was true. But he said, all right, let's, let's just assume that these electrons are embedded in these positively charged uh, uh, matter of ma uh, matrix of matter. His model of an atom was named the plum pudding model. Now, <clears throat> you might not know what plum pudding is. It's actually a, an English dessert. Um, they, the English call anything that's a dessert pretty much pudding. Um, and so, like, if you made some sort of bread, right, with stuff in it, they, they'd, call it they'd call it pudding, right? This is kind of what they call desserts. Um, so it's really better if you picture this as an American. Um, well, this is an American school. Picture a chocolate chip cookie. Okay, so the chocolate chips are the negatively charged electrons. And the rest of the regular cookie is this kind of diffuse positive matrix that balances out the charge of the chocolate chips or electrons. A few years later, Ernst Rutherford performed something called the gold foil experiment, which disproved the plum pudding model of the atom. Now, not to say that it was full of bad ideas and it, there was nothing beneficial from it, but he changed one specific part, right? A very, very important part. And, and it caused the atomic theory to change over time. A beam of small, positively charged particles, that's important, they're positively charged, called alpha particles, were directed at a thin gold foil. Rutherford's team measured the angles at which the particles were deflected from their former straight line paths as they came out of the foil, right? So they would go through the foil and they were, you know, shot on a straight line, but they would measure as they went through the foil if they were deflected at some sort of angle. Rutherford found that most of the alpha particles shot at the foil passed straight through the foil as though they hadn't hit anything. But there were some very few that were deflected at pretty high angles. In some cases, the alpha particles were deflected straight backwards at the origin of the alpha particles. So this is a representation um, of the gold foil experiment. We have uh, this kind of device that is designed to read the alpha particles. We have the gold foil. It's just a very, very thin sheet of gold. And this is the source of the alpha radiation. And so alpha particles would be shot at the foil. And now most of them went straight through. But sometimes they would see that the alpha particle had been deflected at an angle. And sometimes it was a pretty small angle. But sometimes it was a very wide angle and almost backwards, backwards. Rutherford reasoned that each atom in the gold foil contained a small, dense, positively charged nucleus surrounded by electrons. A small number of the alpha particles uh, directed towards the foil were deflected uh, by the tiny nucleus, which you see right here, right, in, with red arrows. They would actually be deflected by something in the middle, which we now know as a nucleus. Most of the particles, however, would pass straight through un, um, undisrupted represented by these black arrows right here. So most of the alpha particles went straight through, no problem. There were some that had a very small deflection and some that had a very wide deflection. And so Rutherford postulated that there must be something in the middle here, because he didn't know about the nucleus. Remember, he, we're still working on the chocolate chip cookie model, the plum pudding model. He, he thought that there must be something very dense and small in the middle of that atom. Rutherford reasoned that only a uh, very small concentrated positive charge in a tiny space, remember, because it didn't, n not many things hit it, so it must be very small, within the gold foil atom could possibly repel the fast-moving alpha particles enough to reverse the alpha particle's direction. Rutherford also hypothesized that the mass of this positive charge containing region, which he called the nucleus, which again is just kind of a generic word, really, must be larger than the mass of the alpha particle. Why? Because it bounced off of it, right? If you threw a bowling ball at a basketball, the bowling ball would not bounce backwards. If you threw a basketball at a bowling ball, yes, the basketball would bounce backwards. Rutherford argued that the reason most of the alpha particles were undeflected was that most parts of the atoms in the gold foil were empty space. If you go back uh, to the diagram we just saw, most of uh, that area was empty space. The nucleus is actually very, very small. The nucleus is the dense central portion of the atom. The nucleus is made up of protons and neutrons. The nucleus has all of the positive charge, nearly all of the mass, but only a very small fraction of the volume of that atom.
Ernest Rutherford, with Hans Geiger and Ernest Marsden, discovered the nucleus of the atom using a beam of positively charged alpha particles. They bombarded a sheet of gold foil with a stream of alpha particles. Most of the particles passed straight through the foil. About one in eight thousand particles, however, were deflected, sometimes directly back at the source. Rutherford explained these results by hypothesizing that nearly all of the mass of an atom is concentrated in a very small volume called the nucleus. If the nucleus were small, it would be easy to miss. Alpha particles which miss the nucleus are deflected only slightly, if at all. Alpha particles which hit the nucleus are deflected severely. Our next subatomic particles are the proton and the neutron. It's protons and neutrons that make up the nucleus that Ernst Rutherford is credited with discovering. Now, protons are the subatomic particles that have a positive charge, and that uh, protons are found in the nucleus of the atom. The number of protons of the nucleus is the atomic number. Okay, it is known as the atomic number. The atomic number is the number of protons. They are the same thing. The atomic number represents the number of protons, which will therefore determine the identity of an element. Because protons and electrons have equal but opposite charges, a neutral atom, a neutral atom, must contain equal numbers of protons and electrons. Neutrons are the subatomic particles that have no charge and um, that are found in the nucleus of, of an atom. Right, so they come. Uh, they are very, very massive. Okay, they're, they have the same mass as a proton, just no charge. And we can see the difference down here. Again, we got the the symbolization. We have the absolute charge. You see that the neutron has zero. The relative charge, neutron has zero. And you can see that the masses are essentially identical. Now, not exactly identical, but it's very, very, very close. For all intents and purposes, the exact same. So far in this section, we've focused on two aspects or locations within the atom, one being the <coughs> electron cloud, in which you will find the negatively charged electrons, and the nucleus, in which you will find the positively charged protons, as well as a neutrally charged neutron. We're not going to focus too much on the neutron itself in this section. Uh, for example, we're not going to go over how it was discovered, but uh, what I do want to do is show you this model of the atom and indicate where the different portions of the atom are located according to this model. So let's start at the nucleus. The nucleus is a small, dense, positively charged center of the atom. It contains most of the atom's mass. Most of the atom's mass. Not its volume, but its mass. The nucleus is composed of protons, which are positively charged particles, as well as neutrons, which have no charge, or you can say that they're neutrally charged. Outside or surrounding the nucleus, we will find the electron cloud. We'll go over uh, this idea in more depth in a future section. But the electron cloud is an area or volume in which you may find an electron. Now we'll go on to find that electrons aren't going to move in these perfect circles that are outlined here in yellow. But for now, I want you to remember that an electron is a negatively charged particle found in electron clouds. The electron cloud is outside of the nucleus. The size of the electron cloud is the thing that determines the size of the atom. Because remember, the atom's nucleus contains the most of its mass but a negligible amount of its volume, leaving the volume to be determined by the electron cloud. <coughs> now, protons and neutrons are both required for a stable nucleus. Coulomb's law states that the closer two charges are, the greater the force between them. Now, we're not going to cover Coulomb's law in very much detail at all, but when you have two charged uh, objects, the closer they are, the stronger the, the, uh, uh, the force between them will be. So that means if they're attractive, the closer, I get, uh, the closer I get them to each other, the stronger they will attract one another. If they're repulsive forces, the closer I get to one another, the stronger they will actually repel.
Protons form stable nuclei despite the fact that protons repel one another. Right? According to Coulomb's law, they should repel one another. A strong attractive force between those protons overcomes the repulsive force at very, very small distances. This is called the, the nuclear strong force, right? The strong nuclear force. Because neutrons also add attractive forces, some neutrons can help stabilize the nucleus. All atoms that have more than one proton, so basically anything uh, other than hydrogen, also have neutrons. So what have we done? We have done a lot in this video. We've explained the law of conservation of mass, the law of definite proportions, and the law of multiple proportions. We've summarized the five essential points of Dalton's atomic theory. Uh, we've explained the relationship between Dalton's theory and Dalton's atomic theory and the law of conservation of mass, the law of definite proportions, and the law of multiple proportions. Summarize the observed properties of cathode rays that led to the discovery of the electron. Summarize the experiment carried out by Rutherford and his co-workers that led to the discovery of the nucleus. We've listed the properties of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And lastly, define the atom.